All right. Remember, uh, in the first part of this chapter, we started uh, parameterizing curves. Why did we parameterize curve? Because we wanted to do integrals, uh, line integrals, and in terms of the parameter, it is a lot easier to do the integral. I mean, basically, we create an algorithm to do the integral and over a curve, and it becomes a simple integral. So, sorry, I'm getting hiccups. Uh, I'm, uh, the integral becomes just a simple integral over a parameter t from a to b. And here we do the same thing, but a bit, of course, more uh, complicated because we're dealing with surfaces. We parameterize surfaces as a mapping of a region R of UV plane to points on a, a surface and like this. So uh, for every value of U and V, the, uh, we have a point in space and as U and V changes, this uh, point in space changes over a surface. You can like write it like triple like that or in IJK notation and U and V are changing in a region of R in UV plane. And uh, this is the surface. This R points to one of the points on the surface. And as U and V change, this point changes over the surface and covers the whole surface. All right, this is what we're going to do here. So we are going to parameterize surfaces and then uh, define uh, surface integrals. And then um, we do some surface integrals. Uh, we are doing this also in chapter uh, five and six, six and five and six, because we're going to talk about later on the Gauss theorem and the Stokes theorem that um, involve surface integrals and line integrals. So we are all uh, doing all of these things for later. But of course, they have their own applications as well. Here is a um, example of parameterization of a surface. Suppose we have this cylinder that is, uh, has a, is above this circle of radius r in the xy plane. The axis of the cylinder is parallel to z axis and is above this circle. And the circle is centered at x equal to a and y equal to b, means this point, and has a radius r. And the cylinder is about this from C, Z equal to C to Z equal to D. So the equation of the cylinder is this, X minus A squared plus Y minus B squared equal to R squared. And Z equals to, uh, Z is between C and D. So it means the uh, cylindrical part of this, not the caps, all right? And, We, one way we can uh, parameterize this is by uh, fi first finding out, for example, what above which point on this circle the point is that is on, on the cylinder, and then what is the height of that point. So we can do that this way. Uh, we say uh, parameter u and v. u is like the angle that this point makes with the, with the x-axis compared uh, from the center, of course. You see with a plus r cosine u, b plus r sine u. This is the parameterization of this circle <clears throat> as we learned before. And then uh, the other parameter is v, how, what is the z component? What is the z uh, coordinate? How, how high is it above the xy plane? So uh, this way we can parameterize the whole uh, surface. And u goes from zero to two pi to complete the circle. And v goes from c to d. C, c and d, does, they don't have to be positive or negative. It can be anything, any two numbers, but just d is greater than c, all right? <clears throat> This is the parameterization. For example, this point 
is at this angle u and this height v. And u could be like pi over three, v could be anywhere between c and d. This is a combination of c and d. A fraction of c plus a fraction of d always gives you somewhere between c and d. <laughs> All right. That is one example. Is there any question about that? All right. Another example is a sphere. Because we use spheres a lot. Parametric representation of a sphere of radius A or radius R centered at A, B, C means that uh, right now this figure shows the center at the origin, but can be anywhere. Uh, at the X coordinate A, B coordinate B, Y coordinate B, and Z coordinate C. So the equation of the sphere, uh, normally we have it like this, X minus A squared plus Y minus B squared plus what C minus Z minus C squared equal to R squared. That uh, is at, centered at A, B, C, right? So we can use two parameters for this sphere. Usually the parameters that we use is the uh, polar coordinate, the spherical coordinate angles. We can use theta and phi. Theta is the angle of this line to the z-axis, and phi is the angle of projection of this line in the xy plane to the x-axis. All right, so um, we use these two angles for when these two angles are given, the point on the sphere is clear. And then when we change those, uh, this point changes. Uh, for example, um, if you keep theta constant and change phi, this point moves on a uh, horizontal circle like that. And uh, if, if you keep phi constant and change theta, the um, point P moves on the vertical circles that pass through the poles, All right? There's, um, longitude and latitude circles. I don't remember exact uh, name of those things. Anyhow, a parametric representation is this. Remember the X component, X in terms of uh, uh, R theta and phi becomes R sine theta cosine phi. This, and from here, from this center to point P, is R, radius of the sphere. And then if you project that, multiply that by sine theta, you get the length of this part. And then if you multiply that by cosine phi, you get X coordinate, right? So sine theta cosine phi gives you the X coordinate. And then sine theta gives you this and multiply by sine phi, you get Y coordinate. So that's this. And of course, if you add, if the uh, sphere is not centered at the origin, then you add the coordinates of the uh, center as A, B, and C. And the Z component becomes R times cosine theta directly because theta is directly to the Z axis. So this is the parametrization of the sphere in terms of these two parameters, theta and phi. You can call them u and v, but that doesn't help much. It, uh, it is just two parameters. But because we are familiar with these theta and phi, it is easier to just use theta and phi. And theta goes from zero to right. phi, and phi goes from zero to two pi. Professor, so, why, does, why doesn't um, z get two parameters? And uh, for the Z, because theta is the angle directly from Z, Z axis. And if you just multiply the R by cosine theta, you get this Z component of Z coordinate of this point P. Right? Okay, thank you. Because uh, phi, however, is different. Phi uh, is the angle of the projection of this line to the XY and then the angle of that one to the X. It is not directly, if, if Y was the angle of 
this line to x axis directly, which, which is this angle in space, then that uh, x would be uh, r cosine of that angle. But it's not. Okay? So uh, this is the parameterization of the sphere. For, for example, this point that is showing here could be equal uh, for theta equal to pi over six and phi equal to pi over three. Right. So uh, as theta and phi change, this point on the sphere changes. It, it, these are like la latitude and longitude on on the air. You know, each point, each city has a longitude and latitude, and you can pinpoint uh, to any point on the uh, surface of the earth by uh, identifying those longitudes and latitudes. Of course, this is a little bit big. Latitude is the angle to the equator, but this angle is to the pole. So that's a polar coordinate, a spherical coordinate. All right, so we use this, the, the book may use other, maybe another book uses another uh, parameterization, but that doesn't matter. The, some of details may be different, but the results, the final results are the same. So I'm using this kind of parameterization for our purposes. All right, now we want to see how we can find the surface normal and the tangent planes uh, to the surface using this parameterization. So if the surface is parameterized by this R, R of U and V, um, the, the partial derivatives are U and are V. The partial derivative means partial of R with respect to U and partial of R with respect to V at the point P are tangent to the surface S. Why is that? For example, here, if you, um, if you consider theta constant and phi changes, then you're going on a horizontal circle. It's like if you, phi, if you increase phi and keep theta constant, means that the distance to the pole, the North Pole doesn't change. You're just going to the east, you're going directly eastward from that point. But if you keep uh, phi constant and change theta, and increase theta, that means that you're, um, you don't, you're not going east or west. You're, you're fixed in that regard, but you're going directly south or north if you, if you increase theta, right? You're going this way. So you have uh, two, if you take partial with respect to uh, theta, means that you're in fact, uh, finding, if you take partial with respect to theta means that you're fixing phi and you're changing theta means that it's going this way. So this gives you a tangent vector to this, uh, to this uh, theta constant, uh, phi constant. So if there are semicircles like that, that are, uh, that are called phi constant, this is like this. You're going on this curve, right? And then um, this, this gives you a unit vector tangent to that curve. But if you keep uh, theta constant and change phi, you're going around on the horizontal circle like that. And the derivative with respect to phi gives you a tangent line to these circles in this direction, going directly to the east in this case, right? And so this is this vector is uh, r phi, and this vector is r theta, right? And what we are saying here is that these two uh, vectors are uh, tangent to the sphere. And because they're tangent to a sphere and they're usually not zero and they're not uh, linearly dependent to one another, 
they they span the tangent plane of the surface. So I mean, because both of them are tangent to the surface, the plane of them is tangent to the surface. And then if you do cross product of these two, create cross product of these two vectors, you get the normal vector to the surface. Their cross product gives normal vector n of s point p of the surface at point p. All right, so uh, n is ru cross rv when it is not zero. It's usually not zero uh, unless sometimes at one singular point that the derivatives are zero, which, which is not important. All right, so um, this is the normal vector then to the surface and the unit normal vector becomes that normal vector divided by its length. Okay, so if we parameterize, to recap, if we parameterize R with U and V, then derivative with respect to U and derivative with respect to V gives you two vectors. The cross product of these two vectors gives you the normal vector. And the, if you divide that normal vector by its length, it becomes unit normal vector, okay? So you can write it like that too. And remember before we talked about a normal vector as the gradient of the level uh, plane, which was the gradient of G, right? Uh, the surface could be written as some G of X, Y, Z equal to zero. In that case, the gradient, the gradient of G gives you the direction of normal to the surface. And if you divide that by the length of it, it gives you the unit normal vector. These are completely uh, different because that comes from uh, parametrization. The other one comes from a, <coughs> uh, a scalar function that is in three dimension that then you you set uh, the value of that equal to a constant that gives you a plane. In that case, you use gradient of that three-dimensional vector uh, the scalar function. In this case, you're, you're doing parametrization of a uh, surface. It's very different. Anyhow, um, let's find the normal surface of a sphere. For a sphere, we had x minus a squared plus y minus b squared plus c minus z squared, z minus c squared equal to r squared. And we had the parametrization like this. So I'm using the same parametrization. Uh, x is a plus r sine theta cosine phi. Y is b plus r sine theta sine phi. And z is c plus r cosine theta. Theta goes from zero to pi and phi goes from zero to two pi. Now we want to find the uh, surface normal. The normal, we said that we take the partial derivatives with respect to theta. What is partial derivative with respect to theta? The first one becomes r cosine theta cosine phi, right? r cosine theta cosine phi. For the second one, sine uh, theta, become the same, then r cosine theta sine phi. For the third one, the yeah, derivative with respect to theta is negative sine theta, right? Negative r sine theta. And r phi means derivative partial with respect to phi. For the first one, cosine of phi becomes negative sine phi, negative r sine theta sine phi. For the second one, sine phi becomes cosine phi. So R sine theta cosine phi. For the third one, becomes what? Again, negative, sorry, uh, with respect to phi. It doesn't depend on phi, so it becomes zero, right? So this is the, the two, uh, partial derivatives of R. 
So I see one of them with respect to theta is directly towards south. If you are using a sphere as, uh, on Earth, with respect to theta becomes southward, with respect to phi becomes eastward. And then if you uh, do cross product of this, you get a, uh, a vector that is directly upward on the surface of the Earth. But in the case of that, will be the normal vector. So let's find it. R theta cross R phi. So here you can see if you use IJK determinant like that, the first row is the components of R theta, the second row components of R phi. Then uh, what do you what do you get? If you eliminate these two, you get zero minus negative r squared sine squared theta cosine phi. So i times r squared uh, sine squared theta cosine phi, right? That's for the uh, x component. For the y component, you eliminate this. And then you negative times negative uh, become positive j hat r squared again becomes sine squared theta uh, sine phi right and for k you now eliminate this becomes this times that right and uh, this times that minus the other so R squared sine theta cosine theta, see R squared sine theta cosine theta, and then you have sine squared phi. And minus with this negative becomes plus uh, R squared, again, sine theta cosine theta, cosine squared theta. I think first one was cosine squared, second one is sine squared. Of course, this can be simplified because if you factor if you factor all of these, factor this and that, you have what is left sine squared phi, that should, that should be phi. That sine squared phi plus cosine squared phi, right? And so that's the third component. So it becomes like this. R squared can be factored, sine squared, cosine. And the last one becomes just uh, cosine theta and sine theta. And what is the magnitude of that? Magnitude is a sum of all these three squared under square root. So it becomes sine to the fourth theta cosine squared phi sine to the fourth theta sine squared phi, sine to the squared cosine squared theta. And then here, if you factor sine to the fourth, what you're left with is cosine squared phi plus sine squared phi, that gives you one, right? So you have sine squared theta plus this, cosine squared theta sine squared theta. And then, you can now factor sine squared. What you're left with is sine squared times sine squared theta plus cosine squared theta. That's again one. And in it becomes like that, it becomes one, and sine squared comes out of the square root becomes sine theta. So the magnitude of this uh, normal vector that we found is R squared sine theta. Okay, depends on theta. All right, now what is the unit normal? Unit normal is this normal vector divided by its magnitude. So it becomes that. So that's uh, one over the magnitude, which is R squared sine theta times the vector itself, R squared sine squared theta cosine theta, sine squared theta sine theta cosine theta sine theta, right? A lot of Trig, trig functions. All right. 
Now you see that our squared cancels and each one of these has a sign. Sign cancels, sign cancels, sign cancels. So what you get is this. N is sine theta cosine phi, sine theta sine phi, and cosine theta, All right? And now look at, look at these. These three are the things that are here. One, two, three. So because this is X and this is Y and this is Z, you can write these uh, three components in N in terms of X, Y, Z, right? So if X is equal to A plus R sine theta cosine phi, then sine theta cosine phi is what? Sine theta cosine phi can be written as X minus A over R, right? The same way for the second one, sine theta sine phi can be written as y minus b over r. And cosine theta can be written as, cosine theta can be written as, as z minus c over r, right? So we can write these three in terms of uh, x minus a, y minus b, Z minus C. So N can be written as one over R, X minus A, Y minus B, Z minus C. Okay. So we want to make sense of this. What is what is that? You can it this can be written as one over R times the R vector X, Y, Z minus the vector of the center the position vector of the center of the sphere, right? We can call it R minus R of the center, RC, okay? But what is this R minus RC? Let's say this is, this is the sphere. We have, let me, let me just show in two dimensions. This is the center. Uh, this will be the RC. And let's say this is a point on the sphere. It has a red uh, position vector R. Uh, R. This is RC vector. And what is R minus RC? R minus RC as vector is uh, from here to here, right? Because if you add RC to R minus RC, we get R. So this is R minus RC, right? And then what is the magnitude of that? That is from the center of the sphere to, the, to one point on the surface. It has a magnitude of R. If you divide that, vector by its magnitude, what do you get? You get a vector, uh, unit vector in that direction or, or unit vector in that direction. We call it, I call it R prime hat. Not to be, not to be um, confused with R hat, which is in this direction, right? So this is R prime hat, that is exactly perpendicular to the surface and it's a unit vector. So it's a unit normal uh, vector to the sphere, right? So what we calculated to be unit normal vector or this one is exactly what it should be. I'm just uh, going through this to illustrate that this is exactly the unit normal vector. Does it make sense? Yeah. All right. So uh, this is the procedure of finding the normal vector. We, we do, when we parameterize, it doesn't matter how we parameterize it. We have two parameters. We take derivative with respect to each one of the uh, uh, 
parameters. And then we cross product these two um, uh, derivatives, we get the normal vector and then divide the normal vector by its magnitude because it becomes unit normal vector. All right. Now, 10.6 is uh, about surface integral. We are defining surface integral. The surface integral of the vector function f over the surface s parameterized as r of u and v over the region r in the uv plane means that u and v are moving, are changing in uh, uv plane, this region r, u and v, of course, it doesn't have to be rectangular. U and V changes in that region. Uh, and then this function maps this region to the surface. The same as what we had for the parameterization of a curve in a space. We had T, T going between A and B. means that T goes on the T axis, goes from A to B, and then R of T changes over a curve from, from this point A to point B, right? Here is the same. When U and V change in this region, the R vector changes over a surface, right? So, that was that's what that's what we did in here. Of course, you see the changes when when we say r of phi and theta, theta and phi are moving, are in in this plane of r theta phi. One is changing from zero to pi, the other one changing from zero to two pi. And as these change in this region, the r that we have changes over the surface, basically mapping this rectangle. onto the surface of the sphere, right? So we need to imagine what's going on here. All right, so, oops. All right, so we have this situation. Uh, the surface is parameterized with R U V over the region of R. Uh, the flux of the flux, uh, the surface integral is defined by the flux of F through the surface. Means that at each point on the surface, let's say this is a surface, at each point we have dA, we have a normal to the surface, unit normal vector, and has the area dA. And we find f dot n is there's a vector function here, f. We calculate f dot n and there's an angle within them. That gives you f dot n gives you the perpendicular component of f, right? And then multiply that by the area that gives you the flux of f going through that little area and then add all of the contributions by integration, it gives you the total air, total flux of the vector function F through the surface. We can also write it this way. This is F dot N dA is the same as F dot capital N du dV. N is the unit normal vector to the surface and N is the just normal vector that comes from the uh, U, RU cross RV. And dA becomes N magnitude of N times du dV, all right? So let's, let's try to do this integral over a surface, this integral of some vector function over some surface. That is very easy. For example, remember the electric field of a solid sphere of uniform total charge Q 
centered at the origin is given by this E. Um, it is, these two look very similar, but here we have lowercase, lowercase r means the radius of uh, at the distance r, but here is the capital R, which is the radius of the sphere itself. This is the electric field of a solid sphere sitting at the uh, center at the origin. Okay. And it's uniformly uh, charged, means that it has a total charge Q. And the charge Q is uniformly distributed over its volume. Okay. This is X, Y, Z. So if you are inside, means R is less than R. It's given, the electric field is given by this formula, means that it is along, sorry, it is along the unit vector, R vector, and its magnitude is that, if you're outside is also are in that direction, but the magnitude is given by this. It's always, you know, electric field is away from the center of the sphere. All right, so we have this situation. We want to find the surface integral of this electric field over the surface of the sphere of radius r. So if r is smaller, means here, if you have a sphere here, what is, the what is the integral of the electric field here over the surface of this? Or if R is greater, what is the, uh, we are outside here, what is the, uh, the integral over the surface of this larger sphere? Would it be R zero? No, it's not zero. No, it, you'll see that uh, it's non-zero, but it has a very meaningful value. All right, let's let's do that. If you if you have studied physics and you remember physics, you know where I'm going. But I'm going to tell you later. So because you see, I I bring a lot of examples from physics because uh, I studied physics. I I teach physics, and. Um, that's the most relevant uh, examples of these math that we are doing is in physics. So I'm Professor, thinking, yes. When you um, bring the examples from physics, uh, you sometimes mention some of the theorems. Do you want us to memorize the theorems that you mentioned? Mm, no, you don't have to. They're just examples. Yeah, they are just examples. Okay. It show, shows the importance of this math that we are uh, studying and the meaning of it. Yeah. yeah. Got it. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so solution, let's, let's do the uh, integral. So we are building the integral of that. First, the parameterization. The sphere can be parameterized like before, r theta and phi. Uh, we have a magnitude of r the times sine theta cosine phi, sine theta sine phi, and cosine theta. Theta from zero to phi, phi from zero to two phi. All right, now, we want to find the normal normal um, vector. In order to find normal vector, we need to do the partial derivative with respect to theta and phi, right? So partial derivative with respect to theta, the same as before. Nothing new, it's all the same, except that now we have this R in here. It was capital R before, now it's R, lowercase r. Uh, partial with respect to phi is that, okay? The same as before. We cross these two, we found uh, R squared times sine squared cosine, sine squared sine, cosine theta sine theta, remember? But now uh, we have E equal to, uh, for R less than A, uh, less than R means that we are uh, inside the sphere. E is equal to KQ over R cubed times R, right? So R is this again. So we multiply that by KQ over R cubed. 
okay? Kq over R cube R times that triple. So that is the electric field in terms of these parameters. And now we want to do electric field dot N times D theta D phi, E dot N. What is E dot N? This is N, this is E. We need to do dot product. So- Professor, remind me what N is again, sorry. N is the normal vector, which is right here. Thank you. Yeah, normal vector. We want to do E dot N and D, D U D V, which is, you know, uh, the area integral, the area element. So what is E dot N? E dot N, first you multiply this by that, and then dot the other part. So it will be this times this, plus this times that, plus this times that, right? So it becomes KQ over R cubed times R cubed. And then the first, this sine square theta cosine pi times sine theta cosine pi. So it becomes sine cubed theta cosine squared pi. The second times second becomes sine cubed theta sine squared pi. The third one times the third one becomes cosine squared theta sine theta. And then again, you see here, sine squared, cosine squared, and sine cubed can be factored. Sine squared, cosine squared becomes one. So we, this reduces to sine cubed theta plus cosine squared sine theta, okay? And then here you can factor sine theta. What you're left with is sine squared theta plus cosine squared theta, that's also one. So it becomes like that, right? So this E dot N um, reduces to this expression, all right? Now we want to uh, multiply this by D theta, D phi and integrate over the sphere. Uh, it means that in over the range of theta and phi. So this, uh, surface integral becomes double integral over the surface, e dot n d theta d phi. All right, e dot n is that. So k q r cubed over r cubed sine theta d theta d phi. Theta goes from zero to pi, phi goes from zero to two pi, right? And then these are all constant as long as far as theta and phi are concerned. So we can take those out and we can separate the phi uh, integral over phi and integral over theta because you see they don't mix. This is the constant and this is the integral over phi, nothing depending on phi. And this is the integral over theta, All right? What is the integral from zero to two pi of d phi? becomes two pi, right? What is the integral of sine theta d theta over from zero to pi? That gives you a two. So we get two pi for the first one, two for the next one. It comes like this, kq r squared over r cube, r cubed over r cube, two pi times two. So it becomes four pi. Four pi kq r cubed over r cubed, okay? So let's see what does, what does it mean? What is that value? Let's work on it. First, do you remember from physics is four pi k is denoted by one over epsilon naught. All right. This is one over epsilon naught q r cubed over r cubed. And then we can divide by four third pi for the numerator and denominator we become, we can write it like that. Q over four, four third pi R cube times four third pi R cube. So what is this?
What do you think that is? The charge of the sphere divided by divided by the volume of the sphere. Charge divided by volume is the density, charge density, right? And uh, the next part is the the volume of our sphere, the sphere that we are taking integral over. So uh, this becomes uh, rho times v, one over epsilon naught rho times v of our sphere, and rho times v is the charge inside the sphere. So it becomes charge inside or charge enclosed in the sphere divided by epsilon naught. All right. So the integral of e dot dA is equal to Q enclosed divided by epsilon naught. That is the Gauss law. The integral form of the Gauss law that we had in electricity and magnetism, in electrostatics, basically. Remember that? Anybody remember? This is Gauss law. Yeah. Fifteen twenty. Uh, sorry, fifteen twenty. I think that was the class that we took if we went to school. Oh. Oh yes, the the, for, the course 1520, yes, that's right. So you see that the Gauss law that we had over there can be verified with this math, all right? So that, that shows just an uh, example that we know what the answer should be and we get to the answer and that shows that the process is correct, all right. What if R is greater than R? Uh, professor, in just a, sorry to interrupt, just a quick question. Uh, yes. Could you explain that second to last step, I think in the last slide, where you reduce the sines, squares, and cosines oh. squares? Dude, way back? Yeah, sorry, I didn't want to interrupt your train. No of problem. Thought. Which one? Uh, that second to last one where you have sine cubed, sine squared, and it goes into the equal yeah. sign. Yeah, you get rid of like the, the oh, so you You factor sine theta, because this is sine cube, right? So if you factor sine theta, what you're left with is sine squared theta plus cosine squared theta. And what is that? That's just one. Mm. Does it make sense? Yeah, I suspected it was something like that, but it just seemed there were so yeah. many of them on the left side. Yeah, it is. It, it, here, here, first we uh, factored sine cube and we left with cosine squared five plus sine squared five, that's one. So it becomes just sine, sine cube. And then now we have these two terms, we factor sine and that the rest becomes that. So they, they all simplify, the whole thing becomes sine one. Okay, right. thank you. Okay, so so this becomes a Gauss law, and now we want to see what is what if the R is greater than R. If you have R greater than R, as I said, it was big big circle. We want to integrate uh, the e dot d a over that in that surface. So again, R is the same; doesn't change because now this r is bigger now, which is r, r is greater than r. The other time it was smaller than r. But what happens if r is greater? Everything so far is the same. So you get r uh, theta and r phi, the partial derivatives the same, uh, the normal is the same, but the difference is that now the electric field, instead of being this formula, it is now this formula, right? So what is the difference? So KQ over R cubed times R uh, is the electric field, but then e, uh, we put R equal to that again, we get this, KQ over R cubed times R, sine theta, cosine theta, sine theta, sine phi, and cosine theta, three components, right? So now what is E dot N? See, e dot n, this r squared, and this r becomes r cubed, cancels that, we just get k cubed. And the rest is the same. Get sine cubed, cosine squared, 
get sine cube sine squared phi and get cosine squared sine theta. And then again, this simplifies. So the, the first two becomes just sine cube and it, then it becomes just sine, right? So KQ sine theta, that's E dot N. Now we integrate that e dot n d theta d phi becomes kq sine theta d theta d phi integrated over from zero to pi, from zero to pi. And again, they, can, they separate, kq comes out and integral over phi, integral over theta gives you a two pi and a two. and becomes four pi k q. Again, four pi k is epsilon naught, one over epsilon naught. Q becomes one, uh, the result from Q over epsilon naught. And again, in this case, that Q is the total charge that's inside because then above, beyond that sphere, we don't have any other charges. So it becomes the total charge inside the sphere divided by epsilon naught. So the integral becomes Q enclosed over epsilon naught, that's Gauss law again. All right? All right, so you see that the way we define the uh, surface integral, it works with the Gauss law that we know. Any questions? All right. Uh, we, here we want to show that the surface elements with different representations always works. And uh, sometimes we know what they should look like and it, they look uh, exactly the same as what we expect. And the first, uh, this surface area that we talk about is this DA. This DA that we have here or you can write it as this. And so NDA is equal to um, capital N D U D V. And therefore DA is capital N magnitude D U D V, which is magnitude of R U cross R V D U D V. So let's see what, let's see that in different cases. For example, if you have, an, the usual xy plane in Cartesian coordinates. Even you have uh, xy plane, x and y, the r is what? Uh, for every point you have r like that, right? That has a, uh, two components, x and y, right? And then r u, let's say x is u, x is u and y is v. Then r u, which is r x becomes one and zero. That is, that is the i hat, right? Is the unit vector in that direction. So this is that r x and r v, which is r y, is our vector, of course, becomes uh, zero and one, becomes j hat, right? So again, uh, in terms of taking partial derivatives, you see uh, when you take partial derivative with respect to x, means that you keep y constant and you change x. So you're going along the y constant curve and it, Take the partial derivative, you get the vector like that, which is i hat. And uh, when you take partial with respect to y, is that you, you're taking x constant. It means that you're moving along the vertical line, and then the derivative is that, which is j hat. Okay. And then see see what this gives us. What is what is i hat? Uh, cross j hat. Uh, 
What is, what is I cross J? Okay. K. K, which is perpendicular to the plane of XY, right? So it's, it's good. And uh, what is the magnitude of K is one. But then uh, the area element dA becomes uh, dx dy. Means that in any area element, you can take dy in this direction and dx in this direction. And the magnitude is dx dy. The um, direction perpendicular to that is k hat. So you see, it works out the way exactly the way we expect. So this is the typed version. R u is i hat, R v is j hat. The cross product is k, and n d a becomes n d u d v becomes d x d y k hat. And the magnitude of d a is d x d y as we expect. All right. All right. So let's. Uh, Let's use xy plane in polar coordinates. You see, polar coordinates is different. You uh, parameterize, you denote every point, uh, not on, not with x and y, but with r and theta. So, for example, how how far is it from the center? This point. How far is it from the center? We call it r, and what what angle it makes with the positive x direction, theta. But you can always convert that and find the x component and y component, x, com uh, x coordinate. X coordinate becomes r uh, cosine phi, cosine theta, and y, part, y becomes r sine theta, right? And so y, this is y. Y equals r sine theta. So you can use those. So if you want to write r in terms of uh, it, this r vector in terms of r and theta, it becomes a vector. X is this, y is this, and your parameters are r and theta. So u is r, v is theta. And then uh, derivative with respect to u, which is r, is cosine theta and sine theta. Derivative with respect to theta becomes negative r sine theta and r cosine theta. And then the cross product, r u cross r v, becomes this i j k. The first, uh, the second row is the components of r u which are cosine and sine and zero. And the third uh, row are components of this one, which is negative r sine theta, r cosine theta and zero. So if you uh, do the, for the x component, we get zero minus zero. For the y component, we get zero minus zero. The only non-zero component is k component, which is, this minus that, so r cosine squared minus with this negative becomes plus r sine squared k hat. Professor, uh, can you go over how for r v we have negative r sine theta real quick? Uh, it is, uh, v is theta, right? V is theta. We are taking derivative with respect to theta. Becomes okay. Yeah. Negative sine theta. Yeah, I see. That. Thank you. Uh -huh. And then, so we have here. If you factor r, what happens? If you factor r, you have cosine theta plus cosine squared theta plus sine squared theta. That's one. So this becomes r times k half, right? So this becomes R times K hat, and then N D A becomes the magnitude of N times D U D V, which is R D R D theta K hat, right? Just 
this is n multiplied by the udv means the rd theta so it becomes that right and then uh the a then you see the unit vector is k hat which is that so the a becomes r d r d theta right and of course you can see it from this figure if if you make an increment in, in the r and make an increment in the theta and uh, I should say, make an increment in R and make an increment in theta. And uh, so you get the surface like that. You get an area element like that. And if you look, of course, the D theta and the R are very small. When D theta and the R are very small, you can see that this side is the R this side is the r the uh, this side is r d theta and the area becomes r d r times r d theta which is r d r d theta so in physics we just do that we don't bother we do going through all these uh, formally um, parameterizing the surface but of course if you do that it's better so in math we do it this way in physics we just look at it oh that's that's what the area element should be and we can use that area element to calculate the total area of a circle area of a circle of radius r is double integral over the circle of this da if you do that becomes integral of r dr d theta double integral r goes from 0 to r theta goes from 0 to 2 pi then you would separate these two integrals uh, uh, integral of d theta becomes just 2 pi integral of r dr becomes r squared over 2 so 2 pi times 1 half r squared becomes what pi r squared which is the area of the circle, All right? So that shows that this area element is correct and comes from this procedure, All right? Any questions? All right. Um, a sphere of radius r in polar coordinates. We want to see what is the surface element, area element. We have r equal to that again, the representation. u is theta and v is phi. And then n is r squared sine squared theta. Okay, we, didn't, we have done this several times already. And of course, this can be fact. This can be simplified because if you factor the sine theta cosine theta, what you're left with is one. So it becomes just this sine theta cosine theta. All right. And then the um, magnitude, magnitude of n is, um, you see, square of this, square of that, square of that. Um, added together under a square root. So again, as we did before, sine to the fourth can be a factor and you get sine to the fourth. And then sine squared can be factored again. It becomes R squared sine theta. And then the A, which is magnitude of N times D theta D phi becomes R squared sine theta D theta D phi. All right. So this was the, our goal here to find DA. And now we want to uh, see that 
in physics. In, in physics, when we do this, we don't go through this procedure. We just look at the uh, figure and say, okay, what happens if we do an increment in theta and an increment in phi? What kind of area do we find? So if you do an increment in theta, you, you move this distance on the surface and that is R d theta. But if you make an increment in phi, you move this, uh, this uh, radial direction a little bit, and then you get this side, which is not exactly R times d phi, but because here, here you're moving over this uh, circle, right? Over this circle and you're moving according to the radius of this circle, which is R sine theta. So this side becomes R sine theta d phi, this side becomes R d theta, and then we, if you multiply the two together, we get R squared sine theta d theta d phi, which is what we have here, right? Right? Okay, so, um, this is the area element that we expect to get R square sine theta d theta d phi. Any questions? All right. Now let's use this to find the total area of a sphere. Area of a sphere of radius R. Theta goes from zero to pi, phi from zero to two pi. Double integral over the surface of the sphere, dA. That is the total area. So that becomes double integral of R squared sine theta d theta d phi. Again, is the bonds of theta goes here from zero to pi and phi goes from zero to two pi. Again, we can separate the integrals R squared comes out because it's not depending on theta and phi. And integral over phi is separate, integral over theta is separate. And then integral over uh, phi becomes two pi, integral over theta becomes again a two. And that becomes four pi R squared. That's why we have four pi R squared as the area of a sphere. Okay, makes sense, any questions? Why does theta only go to pi? Because to cover, um, to cover the whole sphere, you just need to go uh, uh, in the vertical direction, uh, up and down, you go from North Pole to South Pole. And for every point, then go around the circle to complete the sphere. Got it. Thanks. You're welcome. Any more questions? All right. So this is an, uh, another example, like a mathematical example. It's, of course, it has a physical meaning also because it's blocks of water. Find the blocks of water through the parabolic cylinder S given by Y equal to X squared x between zero and two meters and z between zero and three meters. If you look at this, uh, let's, let's look at this, what, what this means. This is x, y, and z. And you see in the xy plane, we are on, the, on a parabola, y equal to x squared, and x from zero to two. So it is kind of like this, right? This is y equal to x squared. And then for every point of this, z is from zero to three, right? So in, uh, z goes from zero to three. So we have another parabola like that in here. And 
this is the surface that is a parabolic. It's a, like a uh, parabolic cylinder, parabolic cylinder. If I, it's hard to draw these figures because how can you uh, make a uh, draw a parabola exactly the same way twice? <laughs> All right, so it's like, kind of like this. All right. So then um, the the velocity vector field, which shows the velocity of water at any point in this space, given by this three z squared minus two y and five x z. Let's see what it looks like in here. For example. In the xy plane, z is zero, so it has only y component. So in the x and y, and if if uh, y is x equal to one and y is equal to one, let's say at this point, oops, let's say at this point, x equal to one, y equal to one, then z is zero, so it means it doesn't have any x component. It doesn't have any z component. It only has um, y component equal to negative two meters per second. Means that the water at this point is moving in the negative y direction, right? Negative y direction. At some other point, let's say at z equal to one, uh, and x equal to one, y equal to one, x equal to one, y equal to one, means at this uh, point here, all of them are one. Then you can put all of x, y, z equal to one. So you get three, uh, v, at this point, v becomes, x component becomes three, y component becomes negative two, z component becomes, um five right so it has a negative two in the y direction three in the x direction and uh, five in the y direction so it's kind of like this vector and the surface integral is created by multiplying each one of these uh, the vectors at any point, the vector is in a certain direction, right? And has a magnitude. When you do, oops. When you do um, the integral of, this is F, F dot normal force, this is N, then uh, du dv, then you calculate actually the uh, how much uh, flux, how, how much water passes through this area element here, per unit time. So we're going to do that, okay? So we take U to be X and V to be Z. We have Y equal to X squared, so X, Y becomes U squared. So R that is X, Y, Z becomes U, U squared and V, All right? This is R. So this, if you change U and V in this region, this R moves on that uh, plane that I draw, I drew for you, all right? So this is the parameterization of that surface, right? And then the derivative with respect to u is one, two u and zero. And derivative with respect to v is zero, zero and one. And then cross product of these two is i, j, k, one, two u, zero, 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 one. And you see that, that it has a, um, it has uh, x component equal to two u 
and it has a y component equal to uh, negative one and it has z component equal to zero right if you eliminate this zero times zero so it becomes two u minus two u i hat minus j hat or two u negative one and zero and this is the cross product so far so good and now this is v v in terms of uh, u v and uh, v in terms of u and v velocity vector in terms of u and v parameters so for um for x we put u for y we put u squared for z we put u v right so the x component of f is two, three z squared means three v squared here y component of f is negative two y y is u squared so negative two u squared and z component is five x z which is five u v all right so we write f or velocity vector in terms of the parameters u and v and we have normal force normal force not force normal a uh, vector in terms of u and v as well. It happens to be only uh, depending on u. And then we do uh, n dot f or f dot n. f dot n means this times that plus this times that plus this times that, right? f dot n comes two u times three v squared, so six u v, v squared minus negative two u squared becomes plus two u squared and zero times the other. Okay, so that's f dot n. And then we want to do in double integral f dot n du dv over the range of u and v. So this is f dot n, so we put that in du dv over the range of u v u is from zero to two v is from zero to three and so we put the limits there are many there are different ways of doing that the easiest is that to break this into two pieces because the integral is linear so it becomes the integral of six u v squared plus two u squared and six comes out integral of uv squared six times and two times u the integral of u squared and then for each one of these integrals you see uh, you can separate the integrals because um because they don't bother each other this is the integral over u for integral over u, v is constant. So v squared comes out, right? So this becomes, let me go to details here. This integral zero to three, v squared, integral zero to two, a u du. And then this is, this is that, and then dv. And now this integral u du doesn't depend on v. So that, that's a constant, comes out. So it becomes the integral from 0 to 2 u du times integral from 0 to 3 v squared dv. Right? The same happens here uh, in, in the second integral. So that they all can be separated. So it becomes v squared dv and u du for the first one. The second one doesn't have any v dependence. So it becomes dv and u squared du. So you see this, uh, for this one, you get one third of this v cube evaluated at zero to three, so it becomes one third of three cube minus zero, right? And then for the other one comes uh, one half u squared, put u equal to two, 
So it becomes like this, six times three cubed divided by three, two squared divided by two, plus two times uh, three times two cubed divided by three. So calculate all the integral and the result is, so this is, uh, this is just nine, this is two, nine times 12 becomes 108. The other one, three cancels becomes two to the uh, fourth becomes 16. So 108 plus 16, which is 124. The unit is meter cube per second per, per second. Because um, um, U and V are in meters, F, F B, which was like that was in meters per second. So we get, we get meter cubed and N doesn't have a unit. So we get meter cubed per second. That's the flow rate, volume flow rate of water through the surface. Any questions? Professor? Yes, please. Um, so like for like long integrals, yeah. are you open to um, us using some like integral calculators just in case we get to check our answers and stuff? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I think it's it's important for you to to know how to do them, but no doesn't matter how you do them. I don't care. Okay. Because mm -hmm. it's not a course of calculus, it is um another math course. All right. So this is another example that I don't want to go to details here. Uh, this is another vector field, but this time it's going through the sur uh, flat surface, passing through these three points. So the uh, surface, uh, the, it's a plane that's given by this equation. So do the same procedure, you get u equal to x, v equal to y, and z becomes six minus three, x minus two y, or becomes six minus three, u minus two v. So you get r like that, that's parametrization. And then the derivatives become like this. And then when you uh, cross product, the two becomes a um, simple constant normal force normal, not force, normal vector, right? Um, and it is expected to be constant because the flat plane, the normal vector to the flat plane is only one vector, it doesn't change direction. And F is that you write in terms of X, Y, Z, and it doesn't have a Z dependent, so it's just X, Y. And then you do the, uh, the dot product, and then you just do the integral. The only thing that is a little bit uh, odd is this, the limit of the integration. So why, why is that? It's because you're, uh, you're integrating over a region that is um, in UV region. UV region means XY region. X, Y region, I, I chose this here, X and this Y. So X, Y region is this triangle, right? In the X, Y plane. So if you want to integrate over the, that region, you learned in calculus two that you can integrate over one of the parameters from one end to the other, over the other one from, this from here to here, depending on what other parameter is. Here, I see V is the last, that is Y. So Y is integrated from zero to Y to three. And then for each one of those Y's, X is integrated from zero to this line. Means that Y is that much, the integral is smaller. I mean, the interval is smaller and so forth, okay? 
So um, it depends on where y is, x changes with that. All right, so in, the, in these cases, you need to write uh, x in terms of y. If you write x in terms of y, you see that the, um, there is an um, intercept x in terms of y is intercept two, and the slope is uh, rise over on negative two third. So that's why you have two minus two third v, right? All right, so uh, this is why you have, this is why you have, oops. This is why you have um, this limit of integral like that. So for u, u goes from zero to this line, v goes from zero to three. All right? Um, that's, the, that's the only difficulty. Yes, please. Is the rise over run like three over two or two over two? Uh, depending on if you. Let's say you want to find in a y in terms of x. Rise is negative three. You go from here to here. Rise negative three, right? Run is two. So negative three over two y is negative three over two x plus three. So then now you want to find x in terms of y. You solve this for x. So uh, negative three over two is equal to x, negative three over two x is equal to y minus three. And then you multiply by, by negative uh, three over two, negative two over three. So x becomes negative two over three y uh, plus two, which is what you have here. Right? The slope is negative. Because yes. One is increasing, the other one decreasing, right? Both so yes, please. Do you have to set u equal to x and v equal to y? No, you don't have to. This is one way to parameterize. But it is easier because then z will be in terms of uh, u and v simply. Otherwise, if we can take z to be u, for example, then um, X will be fractional in terms of U and V. That makes it a little bit harder. But that doesn't matter really. Okay. All right. Where did you get R U and R V? R U and R V. Right? This is from here. R means partial of this R with respect to U and with respect to V. With respect to U becomes one, zero, and negative three. With respect to V becomes zero, one, and negative two. Okay? Okay. Another useful form of surface integral is when uh, you don't calculate the normal component. It's not a flux. It's just a scalar function here. Scalar function G as a function of R. Uh, of course, R is a function of U and V, and um, but the A can be written as N magnitude of N du dV. You can write it this way. Uh, this has its own usefulness. For example, uh, if G is one, this becomes total area. If you put G equal to one, see the double integral of DA. You add all DAs, it gives you the total surface uh, of the surface, surface area of the surface. If G is sigma, which is the uh, surface mass density of the surface, it gives you the total mass of the surface. If G is sigma R squared, where R is the distance of the surface area element to some axis of rotation and sigma is the surface mass density, it gives the rotational inertia of the surface S about that axis. All right, so let's try that for a special case. 
find the rotational energy of a thin spherical shell of total mass M and radius R centered at the origin about the Z axis. So again, we do the parameterization as before, and we already know what dA looks like. dA is R squared, sine theta, d theta, d phi, and G is sigma R squared, and sigma is the surface mass density, which is the total mass divided by the total area, which is M divided by four pi R squared. All right? And then uh, R is the distance of the point R theta phi from the Z axis. So what is the distance of a point from Z axis? It is, uh, if you project that into X, Y, and then that projection has the same distance to the origin, right? So it becomes like this. R becomes square root of X squared plus Y squared, which is R sine theta. Uh, if you do, uh, this is, this is X. X is R sine theta cosine pi and Y is R uh, sine theta sine phi. Again, if you do a square both of them and under square root, it becomes an R and then sine squared, sine squared, cosine squared pi, sine squared pi, gives you sine squared, comes out of the integral, becomes R sine theta. Or on the other hand, you could say, if you are on a square, on, if you are on a sphere uh, anywhere with parameter, you know, theta is the access to the, theta is the angle to the Z axis, then uh, the distance to the Z axis is this R times sine theta, right? So R sine theta is uh, the, the distance that we, we say R, and then we have rotational inertia equal to double integral of G of R dr, G of R is uh, sigma R square. R is that, right? So it becomes sigma R square sine square theta. And the A becomes this, right? G of R is sigma R square. And R is this. So it becomes sigma R square sine square. And the A is that. And that um, becomes sigma r to the fourth comes out. Example, double, double integral of sine cube theta d theta d phi. And you can do sigma. Uh, we separate the two integrals, separate uh, integrals over phi and theta. So integral over phi is simple. It becomes two pi. But for sine cubed, you can write sine, sine times sine squared. Sine squared can be written as one minus cosine squared. And then if you take cosine theta as u, then sine theta d theta becomes uh, negative du. So it becomes negative uh, two pi sigma r to the fourth, and uh, so if you, this becomes one minus u squared. This is different u. Uh, u squared, u is cosine theta now. Uh, one, then integral of that will be u minus u cubed over three. And the u is cosine, so it becomes cosine theta minus cosine cubed over three. And evaluate that between zero and pi. So if you put pi, cosine of pi is negative one. So it becomes negative one minus one third negative one cube. So cosine becomes negative one plus one third, right? And then for zero, you get uh, cosine of zero, which is one uh, again plus a minus one third, and there's a negative sign in front becomes negative one plus one third. 
And now you see it becomes negative two pi sigma r4 times negative two plus two third. So it becomes negative, uh, becomes uh, four eight, negative four eight, if this negative becomes negative, becomes positive four eight and times two becomes eight third pi sigma r to the fourth. And then uh, now what is sigma? Sigma is this, replace sigma by that, becomes that, r squared cancels, pi cancels, four cancels, you get two third m r, r squared. Two third of m r squared. So this is a formula that we have for rotational inertia or a, a spherical shell of mass m around its axis. All right. How much time do we have? Okay. This was a uh, rotational inertia example, which was an application of that kind of uh, scalar surface integral. All right. Connection with concepts in calculus. Let's see what happens when we have a surface represented by z equal to f of x and y in this formulation. Remember, in calculus, we don't have parametrization of surface. We have surfaces as z equal to f of x, y. And then we want to find the, uh, we see what happens in this case. So you can take u equal to x, v equal to y, and z becomes f of u and v. So r becomes u, v, and f of u, v. And the partial with respect to u of that becomes one, zero, and f sub u means partial of f with respect to u. And partial with respect to v becomes 0, 1, and f sub v. And then the cross product becomes this, ijk, 1, 0, f u, 0, 1, f v. And if you do the cross product, it becomes like that, negative f u. You see, here for the first component, zero minus F sub U. And for the second component, it's negative J times uh, F V minus zero. So negative F V for this third component becomes uh, one minus zero, okay? And then the magnitude of N is just magnitude of this cross product, which is square root of one plus F U squared plus F V squared, which is because U is X, V is Y, becomes square root of one plus F X squared plus F Y squared. So DA, which is the magnitude of this times the U DV becomes magnitude, becomes this square root times the u of dv, and if you replace everything by x and y, becomes this, square root of one plus fx squared plus y squared, uh, and dx dy. And therefore the area becomes the double integral of dA, which is double integral of square root of one plus uh, partial f with respect to x squared plus partial of f with respect to y squared. This is a typo dx dy, and that is the formula that you know from calculus. All right, so our uh, formulation is uh, con consistent with all the other things that we know. All right, any questions? All right, this is the homework for next week and that's all i have for you today if you have any questions welcome to ask if not i see you later and i have my office hours of course after this from 3 to 350 
You're welcome to come and ask questions. Thank you, Professor. You're welcome. Thank you, Professor. Thank you, Professor. You're welcome. Have a good day. Thank you.